We are uh, delighted to welcome three speakers today. Um, our speakers are Lauren Working, Shaheen Ali Khan and Elizabeth Grass. And we are going to hear three papers in succession. Each paper will be around 15 to 20 minutes and then we'll take Q and A's after each individual paper. So if you do have questions that occur during the speaker's paper, please do pop them into the chat. And then I will come to those after each individual paper. Um, or indeed, if you've got any comments as well, because um, we'd like to encourage lively um, participation and sharing of knowledge and sharing of, of opinions and information amongst our seminar participants. So please do use the chat function. Um, before we get started on today's seminar, um, I'd just like to give you a heads up on our next seminar, which is on Thursday, the 17th of March, and that will be on the theme of commemoration and community activism. Um, we are going uh, really intercontinental with our speakers for the next um, seminar. We have Karen Burns from the University of Melbourne, who will be giving a paper titled Memorialising Frontier Violence, Perimbete Country House in Victoria, 1838 to 2001. And Karen will be using um, a series of murals in a country house to explore encoded memories of frontier violence and displacement of First Nations people. And we'll then be hearing from Melanie J. Newton and Andrew Lockhead of the University of Toronto. And their paper is titled The Power to Matter, Public History, Race and Commemorative Politics in Toronto. And Melanie and Andrew are going to be talking to us about the crucial role that ac community activism played in renaming Dundas Street in Toronto. Dundas being um, a politician who um, had pro-slavery politics. And it was really the, uh, the grassroots activism that arose after the, the catalyst of, of the Black Lives Matters movement um, in early 2020 that galvanized um, the activism that led ultimately to the renaming of Dundas Street. So I hope you'll be able to join us for that. Um, the booking link is now live on the IHR website, but I do need to flag that we are running that seminar at a different time from our usual time. It will be at uh, 4 p.m. Eastern day, daylight time, uh, 8 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time, and 7 a.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Time, because we are accommodating three different continents. Um, and so please do have a look at the IHR page and book that. We would love to see you there. Um, but uh, to come back to today's seminar, our theme today is transatlantic displacement. And we will be looking at the movement of um, people, of ideas, of the natural world and of commodities across the Atlantic in both directions. Um, so I'm delighted to uh, introduce our first speaker, Lauren Working. Um, Lauren's a lecturer at the University of York. Um, she's an associate on the TIDE project at the University of Oxford. And Lauren's first book, The Making of an Imperial Polity, examined how colonialism influenced English taste and politics in the, the late 16th and early 17th centuries. And Lauren recently won the um, Royal Historical Society's Whitfield Prize for that book. Um, Lauren also has an interest in museums and has uh, that led to curatorial work and consultancy for the World Museum in Liverpool, the Middle Temple Library and the National Portrait Gallery in London. And Lauren is also um, a BBC New Generation thinker. And today she's going to be talking to us um, about maize, dyes and tobacco pipes, the plantation imaginary in early Stuart estates. So Lauren, can I invite you to, uh, to share your screen, please? Um, thank you so much, Amy. Um, yeah, let me find my PowerPoint. There we go. Can everyone see that all right? That's perfect. Excellent. Um, great. Well, thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me to take part today. Um, I've, I've really benefited from um, kind of attending the other sessions, so it's really nice to be um, a, a presenter this time around. Um, when Ollie Cox said that the theme of this seminar was transatlantic displacement, I thought of the essay by Stuart Hall from 1991, where he wrote that I am the sugar at the bottom of the English cup of tea. They don't grow it in Lancashire, you know. Not a single plantation, um, tea plantation exists within the United Kingdom, yet there is no English history without that other history. And Hall was referring to the large scale sugar, tea and coffee plantations of the later British Empire, 
Um, my departing point is the relative absence of an understanding, although this is really rapidly changing, um, of plantation life and its connections to English politics and culture at the beginning of empire, or maybe even before empire, um, in the late 16th and early 17th centuries. We have really valuable studies on 18th century imperial Georgics, on slavery and the culture of taste, um, in the works of Simon Jacandi, Madge Dresser, and James Walvin, for example, which, which connect enslaved lives and country houses. Um, so today what I want to do is look at displaced or moving objects and how they relate to elite sociability and English estates. Um, so I want to look at tobacco, um, still life painting, and also um, imagined objects in country house poetry um, to think about how these can offer insight into ideas of colonialism and empire as it developed in England prior to the civil wars. Um, this can elucidate our understanding of 17th century civility, including absences and erasures that are embedded within it. Um, and it has implications for heritage as well. The ideology of civility has a really profound influence on the colonial world for centuries after this period. Um, civility's seemingly playful charms, its fictions of harmony, still beguiles visitors to estates and heritage sites on both sides of the Atlantic. So how can we use English country houses, um, their collections, their spaces, to bring out different stories? Where do we actually find connections to plantation this early on in the English colonial project. So tobacco is always going to be a really key example for me because it, it's so pervasive in England. I mean, here's just a snapshot of some extant um, tobacco pipes from the early 17th century that have been found by archeologists. Um, tobacco becomes a commodity of mass consumption by the 1630s. Um, so it offers us insight into the development of English territorial expansion but also, and this is really critical, allows us to engage directly with indigenous knowledge and cultivation as well. Um, so I'm really fascinated by the fact that as early as 1599, English authors praised tobacco for evoking a most gentlemanly like smell. Um, so gentlemen were kind of already incorporating tobacco into the social habits of um, their, their lives as fashionable members of the gentry. Although tobacco was grown in England, James I banned domestic tobacco growing in 1619 in order to give the fledgling English colonies in Bermuda and Virginia a chance to develop what was already becoming their most lucrative export. So there's quite an intimate sense of connection between English smoking and Jamestown in particular in this period. Um, and for the political elite, smoking is often overtly connected to the advancement of the colonial project because gentlemen are kind of engaged in very heated debates in parliament um, about kind of combating uh, the, the Spanish empire through colonialism as they're kind of um, incorporating smoking into their social rituals. And at the same time, different indigenous practices around tobacco consumption were deeply significant for how sociability developed within domestic spaces in England. Um, and I'll just summarize um, some of my thoughts here because I've written about this at length um, in an article that recently came out in the historical journal called Tobacco and the Social Life of Conquest, um, which is part of a really great special issue about intoxicants and early modern globalization. Um, but as physical entities, tobacco plants were produced in ways that related to specific geographies. Gentlemen drew distinctions between pudding or roll tobacco, um, kind of what, what we think of as cigars, and the cured loose leaves um, that were more associated with the English plantations in North America. So some 10 years after Thomas Harriet's contact with Algonquins in the 1580s in Roanoke, the London poet Anthony Shute remarked, that it seems that the South American Indians used to take their tobacco in other manner of pipes than we, which the Indians make of palm leaves and such like. So these wide palm leaves um, refer to the roll tobacco or cigars um, favored by the Spanish, which English writers relate to the Iberian Empire, but also to longstanding practices of indigenous groups in the Caribbean and South America. So one English physician wrote about how tobacco is of high respect among the Indians of South America and the Caribbean who smoke through a cane. And you can see the differences here 
um, on the engraving on the left, where there's the kind of um, rolled tobacco that the indigenous peoples are smoking. And then again, that image um, from this 19, uh, 1599 publication of gentlemen smoking um, the, the white clay tobacco pipes that are more modeled after North American indigenous groups. Um, so the first thing to know is just that even when an English gentlewoman or English gentlemen um, light their pipes in a chamber in rural England in the 1620s, he or she is already smoking in a way that has been shaped by several decades of interaction between Elizabethan explorers um, in North America and indigenous peoples who taught them how to pipe smoke. Um, and behind that also lay these long vehement debates in the House of Commons where merchant gentry MPs fought to secure crown backing for English colonies by banning Spanish grown tobacco. Um, at the same time, or precisely because of this proximity between English and Algonquin smoking, gentlemen search for ways to what they call improve or transform the objects and social practices around the plant that they have appropriated. So indigenous and English pipes display marked differences in terms of color, in terms of material and form. Um, and tobacco boxes made of costly materials such as silver or ivory for those who could afford it did not contain American imagery on them. So they often bear profiles of the royal family or of family coat of arms um, alongside mottos written in English or in Latin. So this distinct absence of indigenous motifs, despite tobacco's clear associations with plantations in the Americas is hugely significant. We've often taken the absence of indigenous objects in country houses as evident of a general disinterest in colonization in the early 17th century, when we should perhaps view this absence as a conscious marker of the success of what the English called the civilizing project. Scholars have established that on the whole, Eastern goods such as textiles, turbans, and slippers became the commodities with global appeal in England. But for the English to have widely acknowledged the levels of craftsmanship involved in indigenous material culture would have um, in some ways challenged these commonplace English depictions of native peoples as needing redemption through colonial domination. So um, tobacco is a form of transatlantic displacement. It's a commodity grown and cultivated through the assistance of indigenous peoples um, and often African and indigenous labor but repackaged into this, this kind of intoxicating endorsement of urbane civility. Um, so that's perhaps the library or the chamber, um, but what might be on the walls of a country house while a man or woman um, smokes? So recently I've been doing some work on still lifes and how these paintings might connect to plantation ecologies. And um, this is kind of a whole talk in of itself. So again, I'll just kind of give a brief example. Um, but the top left and the bottom right images are details of two 17th century still life paintings um, from the National Trust collections that contain um, maize and squash. And there's hundreds of other examples of still life paintings that also contain tobacco. Um, and just to give one kind of case study example of how we might use these to, to open up these global connections. Um, here is Nathaniel Bacon's cook made with still life vegetables and fruit from the 1620s. Um, it's very much in the imitation of domestic kitchen or market scenes from Dutch art. Um, and this image really equates the abundance of nature with sex and the female body. The woman's breasts swell like the gourd in her hand. Um, and I don't know if you can see this from, from the image um, quality, but the, the cabbage and the root vegetables um, are rather phallic and also quite aggressive. Um, so you might be able to see that the, the, that large cabbage um, has a leaf that's kind of extending a tendrilled hand uh, towards the cook maid. Um, and this painting is actually one of the earliest English examples of the still life genre. Um, so it might seem quite domestic at first glance, um, but the more we look at it, the more we might notice um, other, other kind of influences coming in. So in the bottom right 
um, clusters of grapes spill over a large glazed Chinese porcelain dish, the result of opening trade routes between the East India Company and Silk Road merchants. Um, but also scientific analysis undertaken by Tate Britain has revealed that some of the red dye is cochineal, um, so almost certainly from Central America, where the pigment was produced by indigenous laborers who harvested and crushed the beetles that grow on cactuses. Um, and curators have also suggested that the variety of yellow and green squash in the lower right hand side, um, as well as the, the runner beans and the pea pods and some of the paler grapes um, could actually have come from the Americas. And indeed, there's a lot of interest in um, cultivating grapes and kind of winemaking industries in Jamestown at the time. So a still life painting might not show plantation landscapes in the same way as um, you know, later images of Brazilian sugar plantations, for example, but they belong to the same social world. Um, and we can add kind of other layers of sociability to the scene. So thinking about the tobacco smoking, um, about banquets and their set pieces, the kind of shells that were gathered from the Caribbean, um, and even books and maps that might have been present or read um, within these social situations. Um, so this, this idea of these, these abundant harvests within still lifes um, become related to global production. Um, and this makes me think of the poet Edmund Waller in his panegyric to Oliver Cromwell, when he writes that ours is the harvest that the Indians mow. We plow the deep and reap what others sow. Um, and, and still life paintings is very much about kind of showcasing that, that reaping of others um, for the benefit of Europeans. Um, so my final example is perhaps a bit more metaphysical, um, but it's thinking about objects in uh, country house poetry. So in early Stuart England, we began to see the colonial gaze enter the country house poem as pastoral modes of writing meld and mix with the Georgic. Um, so with this language of productive labor and industry. Trading ventures and colonial schemes suffuse the country house genre of the 1630s with references to Indian gold, tobacco and exotic fruits. In the country house discourse in early modern England, Carrie McBride discusses the particular power relations at play in the country house poem, a genre that became increasingly popular in the late 16th and early 17th centuries during um, what archeologists have called the great rebuilding of the English elite. Although pastoral and country house poems faced the realities of local labor regimes, um, whether Fenland drainage or coal mining, they also exhibit what McBride calls a neo-feudal world where the estate is the origin and source of political, economic, and social power. McBride observes that discourses about empire entered the insular world of country houses with difficulty and at a relatively late stage in its evolution in the 1630s and 40s, when poems began to reference trade and colonialism. And the poems of Thomas Randolph provide a, a really useful example. So they're published in 1638 and, um, erotic literature, Arcadian pastoral, and global exploitation all kind of merge together. So in one example, he writes of the ivory thighs of a lover who become more soft and white than cotsel wool or cotton from the Indian tree. Um, and I find McBride's study really, really fascinating. Um, but I, I also want to suggest that while she locates the 1630s as the moment when we begin to see the imperial impinge on country house poetry in England, a kind of a colonial landscape poetics has already been developing for several decades by this time. The precursor to a poem like Thomas Randolph or um, Edmund Waller's Battle of the Summer Islands from the 1630s, um, in which he evokes the gentlemanly plantation sociability of shady groves, palmetto branches and tobacco, um, is something like Robert Heyman's poems from Newfoundland written in the 1620s, in which he recalls his youth at the Inns of Court in London and kind of transposes that onto a plantation environment. Um, or even George Chapman's De Guyana, printed in 1596 to endorse Walter Raleigh's voyage to what is now Venezuela. Chapman drew on the language of fertile abundance and the artifice of objects to imagine um, greater Amazonia basically as an elite pleasure ground. 
So he writes that there in Guyana makes society adamantine chains and joins their hearts with wealth whose wealth disjoined. Their healthful recreations strew their meads and make their mansions dance with neighborhood. And there do palaces and temples rise out of the earth and kiss the enamored skies. Um, in New Britannia, the circles of all empire meet. So Chapman's description of palaces and temples transposed onto a tropical Eden is striking. The healthful recreations and mansions that dance with neighborhood are precisely what are seen to transform form Guyana from what Chapman calls chaos to flourishing society. So the built environment, even before it's actually imposed on these spaces um, within the, the imaginary, becomes those adamantine chains that hold a transatlantic civil society together. And um, so moving towards a conclusion, um, kind of what I really wanted to do in this, um, in this talk was just to show some of the ways that I've been kind of thinking through um, how objects and estates and estate imaginaries help bring plantation ecologies and expressions of political authority into our understanding of English civility. Tobacco connects elite white smokers to indigenous soil and plantation labor um, 3000 miles away. Paintings of maize and the dye from a crushed Mexican beetle enter into the still life. Country house poetry evokes the pleasures of estate living while turning to the evocative landscapes of colonial spaces. The shepherd's flute um, or pipe is replaced by the tobacco pipe. And this is kind of a, a, a joke that English wits specifically refer to, that idea of the, the pastoral kind of becoming, and that idea of the pipe kind of becoming um, enmeshed in the idea of the tobacco pipe. So all of this points to the politics of taste in this emerging moment of empire, a mix of fancy and colonial knowledge that contributed to the self-fashioning of the English landholder on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, but I wanted to end with an excerpt from Ruins of a Great House, a poem by the modern Anglo-Caribbean poet, Derek Walcott, who uses the country house poem genre to confront the entangled histories of American plantation and English estates. And I think it's, it's really fascinating that um, a lot of kind of Anglo-Caribbean poets have used the country house genre and its connections kind of Elizabethan and Jacobean history to, to think through these issues of, of power um, and memory. So rather than a view from the great house, Walcott offers a view of the estate from the perspective of the colonized or um, of the survivor. The atrocities of English colonialism are related through rhyme to tangible objects and 16th and 17th century explorers and poets. And here's just, um, a, a brief excerpt from that poem. So he writes of, um, of men like Hawkins, Walter Raleigh, Drake, the world's green age then was rotting lime, whose stench became the charnel galleon's text. The rot remains with us, the men are gone. My eyes burned from the ashen prose of Dunn, and still the coal of my compassion fought, that Albion too was once a colony like ours, part of the continent piece of the main. All in compassion ends, so differently from what the heart arranged. So Walcott ends his poem referencing the well-known Renaissance poet John Donne's Meditation 17, which also contained the famous phrase, no man is an island entire unto himself, any man's death diminishes me. The ashen prose of con canonical writers mingle with the ash of the charnel galleon. The poem does the kind of work I think is so important in um, history and in thinking about history and heritage going forward. It offers an unflinching means of confronting how pleasure and exploitation, desire and dispossession have long been wrapped up in each other, built into the fabric of the places we inhabit and visit and go to drink our cups of tea. Thank you. And I'm muted. Right. I said what I'd said, if anyone is anyone who can lip read will know that I said, thank you, Lauren. That was a really fantastic paper. Um, 
And I would like to invite um, everybody to put their questions in the chat. And while you're thinking of those, um, I have got a couple of questions which I'm going to take uh, Chair's prerogative to jump in with first. Um, Lauren, as I'm sure you know, we have um, lots of people who are on kind of both sides of the fence who attend the seminar from uh, kind of a practitioner perspective as well as academic. And I would kind of like to explore ideas of interpretation because you mentioned country houses lots of times um, and particularly talking about the still lifes um, that were in national trust collections and I wondered had you done any work with anybody or gone down any kind of thought processes of interpretation and how paintings like still lifes can be used as a start point for um, interpretation to um, to visitors for you know these issues that you've been exploring. Um, thanks. That's a that's a great question, and I'd love to hear other people's thoughts on um, how how they've kind of tackled these things. Um, I've been I'm in I've been in kind of initial discussions with the National Trust, um, precisely as you say, around the still life paintings, um, because I think I mean this is to to be perfectly blunt, um, it's such a contentious issue, and I think a lot of times um, institutions are quite interested in in how you can kind of draw as large an audience as you can into something that might seem not very controversial when you first look at it, and then actually open up all these, these complications um, once you're kind of drawn in. So I, I'm quite interested in how still life paintings, which to a lot of people are just quite boring and mundane and quotidian objects, um, can be a really nice way of, of prompting us to think about the very act of looking, you know, what it means to look at something. And because still life paintings are all about the gaze in some ways, all about kind of tricking the eye and, and thinking about perspective, it's quite a nice way, I think, to open up those conversations about multiple histories and things like that. Um, I suppose another thing I'm really fascinated by is how, um, how to work with poets and writers in, in kind of reinterpreting or to, to respond to material as well. Um, so I've done a bit of work with the, the wonderful poet, Sarah Howe, um, with her kind of interpretations of the Chinese ceramics at the World Museum, for example. And the really amazing thing there is that her poetry has now been incorporated into this immersive permanent display there. Um, so I think museums are, are really interested in, in those kind of more creative, collaborative ways into um, opening up these histories, but it, it takes time and, and money. <laughs> um, so yes. I'm still working on how best to do that um, with the still lifes. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, I, I'm sure there are all sorts of different directions that you can go off onto as well, you know, horticulture as well as artistic and you know creative um sort of engagement um but yes very uh, fruitful area and um, we've got some other questions coming in so i'm going to sort of move on to those if i may um we have a question from uh lewis nelson one of our conveners lewis says lauren thanks for that great paper do you have uh oh you know what lewis has actually basically just asked what i was asking in terms of can you do you have ideas that some of these themes could be presented to the public um mm -hmm. I, mean, I guess that's more kind of thematic rather than on individual. Yeah, I mean, uh, one other one other example I can I can add is that um, I've recently been working with Stephanie Pratt, um, who's a cultural ambassador for the Co Creek Dakota, and she's also an art historian. Um, and we've been working on kind of how to do little museum interventions. So we did one in the Ashmolean because they have a still life room, um, the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. Um, so I think also even things like, uh, yeah, just kind of finding ways of, of having interventions into those museum spaces. So thinking in terms of, yes, the long term of, um, you know, changing labels, building new projects or exhibition displays, but on the short term, even, even just kind of gallery tours and, and kind of bringing in audiences to to respond to the material and perhaps to think about it in a different way, I think is actually quite effective. You know, it seems to, to be something that 
they're interested in um, then coming back to the museum with people they know and kind of talking about them in different ways. And I suppose engaging the public through um, social media initiatives, um, through events in galleries, also perhaps um, will invite them to put a bit more pressure on kind of curators and museums um, to, to make them see that people are interested in these diverse histories. And obviously, as we know, in the in the UK, um, it's quite a fraught topic. And there's a lot of dis, you know, there's a lot in media discourse about the fact that people are, are resisting um, these, these opening up and, and diversifying of stories when actually that doesn't actually seem to be the case on, on mm -hmm. the ground. Mm, I think it very much depends kind of where you are as to what part of the debate that you're hearing, because I think, you know, if you move in kind of academic and heritage circles, then it seems like everybody is very pro and there's a lot of great work being done and everyone's very engaged. If you're reading certain sections of the media, you get the impression that, you know, the entire nation is up in arms against this. But I think actually the reality out there on the ground is that this is not perhaps the intense topic of debate that um you know that we're perhaps led to believe and most people are kind of broadly quite sort of um you know on board or at the very least accepting but that's my speculation um i have got a question from um hannah cudsworth who asks um she'd be really interested to hear your views on where you see your research on the presence of late 16th and early 17th century english colonial project um in the country house where where does that have the biggest impact is it is it well understood and established in the field or um, among academics studying this period? Um, and so does it have its therefore, so I think what Hannah tells you is, is it, is it quite established in the academy and therefore the biggest impact is among the public or is there still work to be done in the academy in terms of um, creating um, awareness and understanding and um, acceptance of this aspect mm -hmm. of your work? Um, thanks, Hannah, for that question. I mean, to be perfectly honest, um, while there, there is huge amounts of work being done on it within the academy, you know, on, on opening up these diverse perspectives, um, I'm not entirely, you know, I think the, the Indigenous perspectives is one that, that tend to still be sidelined. Mm. Um, I mean, I certainly met a lot of resistance to my work when I was starting out my PhD. Um, I, I do think that's changing gradually, but I, it, 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 is, it is quite surprising to me that even something as kind of ubiquitous and obviously associated to, with indigeneity like tobacco has still not really been um, thought about through indigenous knowledge. Um, obviously, there are limitations to how much I can contribute to that conversation. Um, so I am also aware of my own biases or um, access to knowledge that I might not have. But that's also why I think the collaborative work is so fruitful and important um, and seems to be something that the Indigenous peoples that I uh, who I have worked with are very supportive of and very excited about. Mm. Yeah, um, and I'm really... Uh pleased to hear you mention that because I, there are several papers that are coming up later in the seminar series that are going to address indigenous perspectives my so ears been thought, um, yeah perk up when you mention yeah. that um i i'm just going to squeeze in one more quick question um from elizabeth who uh, i'll just read out what elizabeth has asked um she says i'm interested in what you say about the layered and performative aspects of smoking drinking and sociabilities being tracked through the early modern world but tobacco less so um, especially as tobacco uh, smoking is now considered a subversive act. Um, perhaps this will be an interesting angle for interpretation. Um, and can I just add on my own kind of thought about that, actually, which was, I think, I thought it was really interesting how an exotic, uh, in inverted commas, commodity was then domesticized. And there is a kind of tension between exoticism and domesticization. Um, which I think kind of links to what Elizabeth was saying there. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, I agree. It's um and it it does change, you know, I, I do think that it changes throughout the 17th century in ways that I haven't fully looked at into a later period. Um, so you know, as mass migration begins to happen, um, do these associations 
with tobacco, are they a bit, dis do they become kind of, do the colonial associations become stronger or do they kind of become diluted? Um, but I, yeah, I think the, the kind of performativity of tobacco smoking is really intriguing to me. And there's some really great um, kind of wit poetry that I, I do think were probably shared in conversation and at dinner parties, you know, poems where the, the act of smoking is kind of built into a poem that's about um, colonizing or, you know, civilizing indigenous peoples. And so it'll be this kind of fantasy romp where the English go um, to North America led by Bacchus and kind of teach Native Americans to smoke tobacco in the proper, you know, civil manner, which is just completely ludicrous. Um, and within the poems, they'll, they'll include things like take up tobacco now, you know, um, and they're divinely touched, puff out the smoke again. So there's a sense in which literature and intoxication and this interest in empire all come together in these performative settings. And while I've focused largely on London up until now, um, I do think there's so much more scope for thinking about that in terms of gentry sociability in these country houses. Um, and also something I, I didn't mention as much, um, which is of course women. And what I'm intrigued there is, are women making the same associations when they smoke tobacco? Mm -hmm. um, those kind of political pro-imperial associations or, or do they have kind of different associations um, in their own social habits? So that's something I'm kind of interested in looking at in the future. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Lauren. We're gonna to have to wrap up there because um, I'm conscious of time, but um, I would just like to say a huge thank you for a really fascinating paper. Um, and um, both for kind of Lauren and all of our other speakers as well, if anybody does have any questions that crop up, if we've got time at the end, I'll come back to open up a general Q&A or you can drop an email to the seminar email address if you have any follow-up questions. So, um, you know, please bear that in mind. So thank you very much, Lauren. Um, Shaheen, would you like to start sharing your screen whilst I introduce you? Um, I am delighted now to um, welcome our second speaker, Shaheen Ali Khan of the University of Virginia. Um, and Shaheen completed her bachelor's in architectural history um, at the University of Virginia in the spring of 2021 and is now um, undertaking a master's program in art architectural history. Um, with a particular focus on historic preservation. Um, and the, the phrase um, charnel galleon that came up in um, the poem that, that Lauren read us really kind of rung a bell um, because I think that that will kind of lead um, you know, that the, the brutal reality, I think, of charnel galleons is going to now come to the fore in Shaheen's um, paper because she will be speaking um, on building a slave ship. Uh, planning a floating prison. So Shaheen, when you're ready. Thank you. Um, thank you, Amy. And thank you, Lauren. That was amazing. So um, I'm honored to be included here. I'm going to keep that brief because in the interest of time, um, I am presenting my research with the hope that honesty about the past will help to us to understand our present and ameliorate our future. Um, so I also want to reiterate that each one of the millions of humans that, um, we're, that we're talking about was an individual. Um, they were, you know, I believe that, that numbers in this discussion are necessary so that people understand the vastness of the scale. But when you only discuss people in numbers, that in itself is dehumanizing. Um, so just please remember that every one of these people was a person with a life and a family. Um, and community. So this paper is given in honor and memory of the millions of Africans whose lives and freedom were stolen from them by colonial and new world avarice and fueled by the plantation empire. This paper as stated, oh no, excuse me. This is not advancing and we tested this. Hold on just a moment. There we go. I'm so sorry. Can everyone see that? Uh, you've come up, you need to re-screen share. Okay, that is, I'm so sorry, we tested this.
There we go. My apologies. And everyone can see this now? Yep, that's working fine. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this paper, as stated in the title, concerns the slaving vessels which were used for four centuries by Europeans to convey African captives to the West Indies, South and North America, and Europe. The transatlantic slave trade was the largest single human trafficking event in history. People were ambushed and kidnapped, traded to pay off others' debt, or convicted of crimes including adultery, witchcraft, and theft. These people were then often marched to the coast from inland countries, sometimes hundreds of miles away, in a journey which took months and lost an estimated two thirds of the people before they were loaded onto European ships. The wait aboard the ship anchored offshore until it was fully loaded was two months up to a year before they even set sail. Once the ship left the coast of Africa, the Middle Passage could take anywhere from another two months to upwards of a year, with most passages falling towards the middle of that range. Slaving vessels saw unbelievable mortality and morbidity rates. More scholarship has come to light in recent years about the human experience of the Middle Passage, but as yet there is very little about the structure of the vessels themselves. This paper is an architectural history of a lost object type, the slave ship. The human experience cannot and should not be divorced from the built environment. I'm looking here to present the emerging structural history of the ships themselves to better understand the human experience, including lasting repercussions for all involved. Of necessity, this is just a selection for my four chapter thesis on this subject. I'll be focusing on the 18th century, which was the height of the transatlantic slave trade. This paper has two primary sections. The first will introduce those elements which were early implementations of and persisted throughout the long 18th century. The second will introduce innovations which began to appear aboard slaving vessels during the latter half of the 18th century. For the sake of time, I am not offering detailed definitions of nautical terms, but if anyone has any questions, please do ask. Since slaving vessels operated as merchant vessels for at least one third of the triangular Africa route and on non-slaving voyages, the most obvious characteristics of a slaving vessel were temporary. The majority of the slaving specific structure, including temporary confinement, was built upon arrival at the coast of Africa. This was in preparation for the middle passage, which was the middle leg of the voyage. After leaving their British, European or American port, the crew of a slave ship embarked on a voyage which generally took several weeks to several months. Upon arrival on the coast of Africa, the captain and officers began negotiations either with their country's factors, who were agents permanently stationed on the coast of Africa, or directly with the local king or cabasir for human cargo. While these negotiations were underway, the crew aboard a guinea man, as African slaving vessels were known, immediately began construction of a temporary deck house to hold the enslaved as they were brought aboard, usually in ones or twos. The deck house was a thatched jail, which you can see right there. And it spanned the length of the open deck. Several spars were lashed together to create one long pole and then lashed across the masts. Tied approximately 15 feet above the deck, this acted as the ridge pole for a gabled, thatched roof over a cage-like structure built of local wood like bamboo, which was tied in vertical and horizontal walls with interstices of four to six inches. This deck house would be dismantled just prior to sailing when the enslaved would be incarcerated below decks. I am going to add that this and the other digital renderings were created by a team of scholars, including one of my committee advisors, Nicholas Radburn, who is one of the authors of the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database. This image is a still from a video which shows a digital reconstruction using the only complete slave ship plans which have been found to date. Concurrently with the crew's building of the deck house, the ship's carpenter and any apprentices would commence building the sleeping platforms which bisected the below deck space along the length of the ship. 
All of this work began after arrival on the coast of Africa, and in some cases, weeks after beginning to receive enslaved people on board. Of all the types of ships used, frigates' greater hold capacity and their speed were the primary reason for their popularity as slaving vessels. Usually between five and six feet in height, the taller between decks areas permitted for the building of broad shelves at the midway height between decks, leaving between two and a half to three feet both above and below these shelves to take on more human cargo. These shelves extended from the sides of the ship towards the center, leaving a narrow passage down the middle of the length of the ship. This was standard practice for at least the last century of the transatlantic trade, regardless of nation. Bulkheads, or heavy partitions, were built at the same time that the platforms were being constructed. Rather than providing more surface area for the disposition of the enslaved, the bulkheads served to separate the sexes. The general layout below decks included one bulkhead between the men's room, which was consistently situated towards the fore part of the ship, and the boys in the middle, and another between the boys' room and the women's, which was towards the aft part of the ship. These bulkheads were nearly always in the form of heavy wooden gratings, each with their own door. This particular image depicts a solid bulkhead, which would not have permitted airflow between the rooms. Early in the 18th century, slaving vessels began to include a wall built all the way across the breadth of the ship. Construction of this wall, along with the platforms, commenced once the vessel had reached the African coast. Generally constructed of sturdy wooden planks, the barricado stretched across the ship right at the mainmast, which was just before the quarter deck. And in this particular image from 1787, you can actually see the individual boards of the barricado. And this particular image, um, the caption also tells you that this was um, depicting an insurrection where the enslaved were here. You can see some throwing themselves over overboard and the crew was behind the barricado and shooting over it. The quarter deck, which housed the captain's cabin, provided an elevated area for the officers and the captain to oversee the main deck. The barricado provided a safe area for the crew to attend the rigging and a wall behind which the crew could retreat and shoot from in the event of a revolt. And there you go. A small door, which could be barred and locked from the inside, provided access to the rest of the ship. Though most accounts, including testimony given to the House of Commons, reiterate that the barricada was approximately eight feet in height from the main deck and extended two feet over each side of the ship, a few mentions that it was about 10 feet high with a three to four foot overlap per side is another indicator of the customization which was possible for these elements. These features began appearing early in the long 18th century and persisted throughout. Now we move along to the features which began to appear during the latter half of the 18th century. These innovations focused on mitigating mortality. The greatest fear for the crew aboard a slaving vessel was of insurrection. Everything aboard a ship was aimed at preventing a rebellion from beginning or being successful, which accounts for the comparatively few rebellions. On most slaving vessels, the grown men were kept shackled in pairs at ankles and sometimes wrists, and were never permitted behind the barricado where the crew, the chest of weapons, and the enslaved women were during the day. Once slave ships had established strategies for resisting insurrection, the vessels began to reflect the precautions necessary to keep the majority of the cargo alive. One method for keeping the enslaved men from active insurrection while above decks was the use of deck chains. Deck chains were a multi-purpose element which allowed a reprieve from below decks and confined the enslaved men simultaneously. This prevented the men from throwing themselves overboard or rising against their captors. A long chain was reeved through a ring in the men's shackles and locked down to ring bolts, which were fastened at intervals to the deck. After being brought up in the morning and having their shackles inspected, each pair of men was added to the chain. In this manner, 30 or more pairs of men would be fastened to each of several chains running the length of the main deck like beads on parallel strings. 
The ends of the chains ran through small holes in the bottom of the barricado and were locked at the quarter deck. Around five or six in the evening, the chain would be unlocked behind the barricado, pulled back out of the holes, and one pair at a time would be removed before being inspected for possible weapons and the security of the shackles. When the inspection was complete, that pair was sent below decks till morning, and the same program was repeated for each subsequent pair. Nets were also used to contain the enslaved above decks on voyages after the latter half of the 18th century, as the deck house was impractical while the ship was under sail. Quarter netting, as it was called, was not originally a product of the slave trade. As with the barricado, slave ship netting was adapted from warship's defensive tactics. The first mention of netting used for anything other than warfare was in 1725. Slave ships suspended nets supported at intervals by wooden or iron bars above the railings of the vessel. And in this particular image, you can see the netting extending the entire length of the ship and up here on the quarter deck. This gave the ship a distinct appearance and was likely the most visually striking element of a vessel coming into port with African captives. Their undeniable purpose was also clear. The ships were surrounded with net to retain their cargo. The most common form of resistance was the quieter rebellion of self-manumission via suicide. The gun ports provided another potential route of escape for the captives and thus were often fastened with iron bars. Um, this particular image I, I like just because of how much it shows. So you see here the gun ports and beneath that you see the next thing we're getting to which are the portholes right there. Some of the key visual indicators for slaving vessels were portholes. Cut low on the ship's hull, barely above the laden waterline, these apertures were an additional measure for airflow. They were generally round or elliptical and made too small to allow for escape, approximately four by six inches. These would be shut during storms, further limiting the air supply. During moderate seas and light rain, they would be shut only on the weather side, meaning the side of the prevailing wind. In tornadoes, rough seas, and heavy rain, all would be closed. During these times, the enslaved would not be brought above decks and would remain confined in the dark with all apertures which permitted air closed, sometimes for days at a time. It was not uncommon for a large percentage of the enslaved to die during these periods. Rectangular holes in the uppermost deck, referred to as hatches, allowed access between the upper and lower decks aboard a frigate. For security upon slaving vessels, these were fitted with heavy wooden gratings instead of solid trapdoors, allowing air to pass below decks. In some cases, these gratings were flush with the deck. In others, a partial box to obstruct water was constructed around the hatchway and the grating itself was set higher. These gratings would be covered with tarps in inclement weather, thus restricting rain, seawater, and air from coming into the interior of the ship at these times, and were locked at night when the majority of the enslaved adults were below decks. By the late 1760s, Slave ships were using wind sails to bring fresh air below decks. Wind sails were cylinders of canvas that were dropped through the open hatches with an aperture facing upwind towards the stern of the ship. The wind caught in the aperture was funneled down, which forced a measure of fresh air to run through the space below decks. Wind sails held perpendicular to the winds which drove the ship forwards by ropes tied into the rigging were like the active sails, correctly positioned to intercept a strong breeze. This positioning was not true of either the portholes along the ship's hull or the gratings parallel to the deck. The portholes and gratings allowed passive access to fresh air. Their positioning occasioned the majority of any wind to blow past without actively entering the enclosed parts of the ship. However, wind sails were not common aboard English vessels and their use was limited. They served no purpose in a calm, nor light winds, nor could they be used during a chase or very heavy winds. During the times fresh air below decks would have been the most vital, they could also not be used. 
the crew pulled these canvas funnels up during weather which necessitated the gratings and portals also to be shut or covered, and at night when the deck gratings were locked to secure the captive cargo. Provisions for human waste were another necessity, and these, like much of the structure, evolved over the duration of the transatlantic trade. Accounts from the late 17th and early 18th centuries describe a conveniency suspended over the sides of the ship, which could seat one or multiple people. At night, sentinels would allow the enslaved up either individually or in pairs to use this facility. By the middle of the 18th century, slave ships began placing containers for waste in the below decks area, which negated the need to open the hatches during the night and ostensibly kept the below decks area cleaner by providing easier access to the accommodation, inadequate as it was. These necessary tubs varied in both shape and number, with most vessels carrying an insufficient number of these tubs to hold the daily waste produced by hundreds of people. Some were casks sawn in half. Towards the latter half of the 18th century, it was not uncommon for these tubs to be conical with an aperture approximately a foot across the top and twice that width at the bottom. However, the logistics of using these tubs, particularly in the dark, were difficult. The men especially, being shackled to a partner who may not have spoken their language, had first to obtain consent from their shackle mate before both could eel their way out from where they were packed on the platforms until they reached the slightly higher passage between the platforms. Then, in the dark, the pair would have to navigate through more rows of men packed together on the floor of the orlop deck before reaching and using a tub. Illness was rampant and fights were occasioned by the reality of people stepping on others and frequently being unable to reach the tubs in time. When Europeans began slaving voyages to the coast of Africa in the middle of the 15th century, they utilized any ship capable of making the crossing. Gradually, certain types of vessels emerged as preferable over others, and existing merchant ships were retrofit to accommodate hundreds of humans stowed below decks. During the 18th century, shipbuilders began producing ships specifically for human trafficking. In order to achieve the highest profit, shipbuilders continued to tweak the design to mitigate mortality. References to peculiar construction date back to the middle of the 18th century, and by the late 1770s, slaving vessels from Liverpool specifically were known to be the best constructed for the trade. Some of this specificity lies in the below deck space, but the actual form of the ship could also be customized to sit at the conjunction of carrying capacity and speed. Ships were being built increasingly sharp in order to lessen the length of the middle passage, which mitigated mortality, which translated to profit retention. The sharpness refers to the hull or body of the ship. Alteration of this major structural component commenced with the building of the ship. The actual hold where non-living cargo was stored was minimized to account for this. Though the transatlantic slave trade did not utilize the majority of any British or European ports ships, the disproportionate profitability of the result of these voyages and the wide scale involvement of many other types of businesses made the slave trade a major component of the English economy during the 18th century. Liverpool in particular acknowledged owing its success to its involvement in the slave trade, and the products of this economy traveled inland. The predominant families with interests in the slave trade were extremely wealthy and held positions of authority within their respective towns. Their great country houses were built with the profits from distant sugar plantations, and therefore the tradespeople and servants needed to maintain these estates were inadvertently dependent upon the trade as well. In order to understand a continuing racial disparity in generational wealth, it would serve us all to remember exactly how and why certain areas or people became as wealthy or powerful as they now are. I wanted to thank you all. I also wanted to mention that my fellow presenter, Elizabeth Grass, is going to go into far more detail about um, the very last thing I mentioned, the, the country houses. And I will leave those questions to her um, and I would like to open this up for any questions.
Thank you so much, Shaheen. Could you um, stop screen sharing so that we can yes. see you and see each other? Um, that was um, that was really thorough and sobering, and um, you know a really important um, paper that I think we needed to hear, although also quite difficult to hear in many aspects as well. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, and I will just say that your um, colleague has just popped a link in the chat to the um, uh, to the slave voyages website org website as well. So um, I assume Shane is your colleague or perhaps not mm, anyway no. there is a <laughs> there is, sorry okay then there is um there is a link in the chat so um do have a look at that people please um i've got a question coming from lucy moynihan which i'm going to read out to you lucy says this is such an interesting and important topic thank you i just wondered um to what extent do you think that the increased provisions for air circulation on the slave ship towards the second half of the 18th century were related to concerns around tropical diseases and the consolidation of race and science um, I'm thinking of this in relation to mitigation of mortality via disease prevention and profit maximization, as you mentioned, rather than for any concern for the welfare of the enslaved people. Um, it, it was definitely profit motivated. Um, that, that is without question. There, you know, there, there were, even early on, there were abolitionists, there were people who were insisting that it was inhumane and they needed to try to do better as as better as you can do um, when you're, you know, kidnapping and transporting people, but the the main motivating factor was was definitely profit. Um, they did attempt to mitigate disease, but the the additional measures for airflow were not specifically intended for for that purpose. Um, so much as just being, I mean, disease was one of the factors that you know, would, would kill off a lot of people um, within a very short period of time. And, you know, a, a lot of that had to do with just the being confined for that period of time. Um, even with airflow, the conditions were absolutely appalling. Um, and there, are, you know, the, the paper I already have, it's, you know, something like 80 pages and it's, it's not complete. Um, but just the accounts I've been reading, the descriptions of what the conditions were like below decks is is really nauseating and, and horrifying. And that that happened regardless of, of the airflow. But um but yes, it was definitely profit motivated. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Um and we have a question from Jalaluddin Khan in um, Trinidad and Tobago who asks, um, can you give details of slave ship food storage, please? Um uh, I'm interested in transatlantic Africa food exchange to the Caribbean. Yes, um, they they started, you know, towards towards the middle and especially a little bit later, you know, 1770s. Um, they started trying to bring aboard the foodstuffs that were local to the people they were transporting to the to the particular, um, you know, the the particular enslaved, you know, the the nations um, and like some some particular parts of the coast they would bring um, yams and some other parts they would, you know, bring rice and they found that horse beans were an adequate substitute for, you know, some of the, the local foodstuffs and that people did better on the food that they were accustomed to. Um, they didn't tend to carry a ton of food for sale. Um, you know, once they arrived in the West Indies, it was mostly like provisions for, for the actual people on, on the Middle Passage. Um, there just wasn't that much space and they often had to stop and pick up more provisions um, at various islands uh, like there were known stops where they could you know refill for fresh water and um, pick up more provisions and occasionally if the provisions ran low if you know the if the weather didn't comply or you know if they got off course they would have to hail another ship and you know get some provisions enough to continue on to to their next port Thank you. Um, we've got lots of questions coming in and I'm going yeah. to try and get through as many as we can. And if we don't have time for all of them, I'm just conscious that we need to allow for Elizabeth's paper, then there will, I know you You said that you would have be happy to answer questions by email later. Mm -hmm. um, so a uh, question um, from Oliver Cox, um, one of our conveners who asked how specialized 
um, were the marine, uh, the maritime architects? Are there are there firms that specialize in fitting out these ships? Is that an industry that develops? Um, there, the the ships even at the height, no no more than about a quarter of the ships that were going out at all for for slaving voyages. Um, or the ships that were leaving a port were going out for slaving voyages. And of that quarter, not all of them were, were purpose-built. And so I haven't found like any particular shipyard or dock that specialized only in enslaving vessels, um, because I don't think that would have been profitable enough for them. But Liverpool was known to be specialized as far as the ports went for being able to produce, you know, purpose-built um, vessels or, or vessels that were, you know, particularly efficient for the slave trade. Um, does, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, just uh, keeping going down through the questions which are coming in thick and fast, um, because everybody appreciates, uh, I think. I'm glad that, people are interested. Yeah, yes, this you know, the... Uh, Stephen says, great presentation with amazing detail. Given the value of the cargo, um, there, uh, there was no value in not getting the cargo to the Americas alive. Why do you think that the owners didn't care enough? Um, so there is one quote by Thomas Clarkson that, um, you know, who, who's a reverend and, and abolitionist, and it was um, their avarice exceeded, or their cruelty exceeded even their avarice. And for a a very, very great portion of this, a lot of the, um, there, oh, there's so much on this particular topic. Um, it, and I think it basically, it boils down to, to power and cruelty. Um, there were, you know, they, they were financially motivated to keep people alive, but sometimes they were more motivated by their, their own sense of power and, um, and control over people and and so sometimes it was more important to individual captains and officers to abuse people or kill people than it was to try to keep them alive as nauseating as that entire yeah. thing is that that is what i found that's um quite a sort of damning indictment of the human psyche isn't it yeah. Yeah. Um, I, much as I would like to keep going, I'm, I'm really conscious of time. And so I'm going to just say to everybody who's put their questions in the chat that we haven't got to, um, we will have a copy of the chat. Um, so we'll know what those questions are. But if you would like to just drop us an email to the seminar um, email, then I will forward those on to Shaheen, who will be very happy to, to follow those up, because um, I think there are one or two that have come up that could probably do with a lengthier discussion anyway. Um, so. <laughs> Um, I just want to say a huge thank you for sharing that really interesting and important project with us. And we've, you know, really appreciated that paper. So thank you very much. Thank um, you. And, um, and that brings us on to our third paper, um, who is our very own um, World and the Historic House convener, Elizabeth Grass, um, who, when she's not convening um, this seminar, is um, undertaking a collaborative doctoral award at the University of Oxford and the National Trust, um, from which her paper today is drawn. Um, Elizabeth, would you like to start screen sharing while I um, yeah. introduce you as well? Um, and uh, besides doing that, she's also a historical advisor on the Colonial Countryside Project at the University of Leicester, and she is co-author of the Colonial Countryside MOOC, that's a massive open online course. Um, and so Elizabeth is going to be talking today with her, uh, about some of the work that's drawn from her doctoral thesis on West Indian slaveholders and the English country house with a focus today on John Tharp of Jamaica. So Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. If I leave it like that, is that sufficient? Can you? Yes, you can that? see that. Is your does it not work with them? Um, it won't. It won't seem to bounce to the full goes. screen. Is that going to be problematic? Because I can. No, it's fine. We can see it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, for that introduction. Um. I'm really pleased to be able to speak um at today's seminar and to be on the presenting rather than the convening side. And um, it's. Wonderful to be in such good company. Thank you so much, Lauren and Shaheen for excellent papers. Um, my doctoral project, as Amy was just suggesting, um, is a kind of large scale um, 
country house study and looking at some 65 West Indian slaveholders who uh, bought and built country houses um, in England and Wales in the 18th and 19th centuries. And um, with the few minutes that I've got today, I'm actually just going to talk in detail about one of these individuals, uh, John Tharp of Jamaica, um, who, um, and I'm going to sort of describe how he used his country estate, which is at Chippenham Park in Cambridgeshire, to manage a transatlantic landowning identity. Um, but his experiences can be extrapolated and compared with the broader cohort of what is sometimes referred to as the plantocracy or the planter elite. Um, and I'm quite preoccupied with understanding how these individuals and their families established themselves within the British landowning classes. Um, and these are the sorts of people whose family fortunes are primarily Caribbean in origin, and their families have been in the Caribbean for several generations um, before this first movement of, of kind of making, making the significant purchase of a country house or a country estate. These people are not without cultural capital because they were almost always educated in British public schools um, and thereafter usually at Oxbridge, but they were first ger generation Arab Easts um, as far as um, land ownership in Britain is concerned. And I think the country estate or the country house, I'm probably preaching to the converted here, but um, has many facets for the historian, um, an essential unit of rural organisation, it's a space for the enactment of sociability, um, a treasure house, even if we are much happier being kind of more critical about the, the kind of treasure house concept, we could still say that they are treasure houses in a way. They're a nexus of various kinds of labour, particularly domestic, political and sexual labour. And of course, um, they are a repository of colonial goods, sites of self-fashioning and uh, spaces where money acquired through brutality in one arena of empire could be parlayed into status and respectability in another. And to my mind, the country house becomes more interesting still when it's not inherited, but when it's purchased or built. Um, and the way that that acquirer then uses the house and estate can reveal a lot about the social and cultural expectations of the landed classes, um, about anxieties and about contemporary perceptions of what a country house quote was for. Um, and it becomes a kind of essential material thing at that point. And, and when they made these purchases, these individuals such as John Tharp occasioned a huge amount of upheaval and, and most significantly, when they moved to Britain, they frequently transplanted unfree people of African origin from their plantations in the Caribbean to work as domestic servants in the UK. And whilst this is only a small diaspora in the context of transatlantic slavery, as we've just been hearing from Shaheen, it carries echoes of that kidnap, enslavement and the larger forced movement of African people within the Atlantic world at this time. And um, I'm not focusing on Tharp's movement of people in this paper, looking instead um, at how he navigated his identity through land ownership and the movement of goods. But I'm in no way seeking to include his essential identity as a trafficker of people because Tharp was both a slave trader and a slaveholder on a major scale. And I think thanks to Shaheen's really excellent paper, the calculated brutality of, of what that means is, is at the forefront of all of our minds. Um, in 1791, so quite late in the 18th century, John Tharp purchased Chippenham Park. You can see it on this map, I hope, just above Newmarket. Um, and he set about establishing his credentials as an improving landowner. Um, and in so doing, privileged the advice. Um, the first thing he did was to privilege the advice of local landowners. And he, he went after the most celebrated agriculturalist in England, Thomas Cook, often known as Cook of Norfolk, many of you may know of. He had been improving his um, estate on the North Norfolk coast at Holcombe for more than a decade, a quarter of a decade by that point. And he famously mingled estate management and sociability, the gatherings that he hosted at Holcombe and the visits he undertook to other East Anglian estates developed into um, a kind of agricultural progress during which he hosted and he was hosted in turn. And he kind of built this into a reputation which hinged around a sort of patriotic honesty and love of the land, a love of country. And John Tharp attached himself to Coke to cook and derived multiple benefits from that association. So Chippenham, Tharp's estate, became one of the sites on Cook's agricultural tours. Um, as Tharp explains to his, journey, to his son John in a very didactic postscript, and there are several letters that survive, clunkily didactic is how I would describe them, between John when Tharp when he goes back to Jamaica and his son who's sort of trying to school um, as, as a landowner. So uh, he writes, Mr. Cook of Holcombe and a small party dine and spend two days here. It's a very inconvenient time, but as you know, visits from great, great men and particularly farmers are always acceptable as something is to be learnt from the experience of such men. And Tharp um, 
thought a great deal about Cook. He aped an ambitious forestation scheme that Cook had implemented at Holcombe. He planned to plant 10,000 trees each year for a decade at Chippenham, writing, um, they are ornamental, they will be profitable, and in so open a country, beautiful. Um, when a little more advanced and complete, um, the, the fen planting, when a little more advanced and complete, will be the prettiest thing in England. And if Mr. Cook's red, red willow take, the profit will be great. So Tharp here is explicitly correlating aesthetic merit and profit through the act of tree planting. Um, and the lower picture here on this slide, if you can see it, does actually show some of the trees he planted at Chippenham as part of the landscape park, which is still there today. Um, I'm not going to show the house because the house is actually bears no relation now to the house that he lived in. Um, but Tharp saw the acquisition of trees um, as a means to both um, maximise estate profits and take advantage of this nebulous um, but no less important benefit of being associated with Cook of Norfolk and his particular brand of agriculturalism. Um, agricultural patriotism. He's effectively kind of um, acquiring a social group through really aligning himself with these um, with these men and with their aims. And it worked, arguably. Um, in just a few short years, Tharp was becoming celebrated as one of Cambridge's most prolific tree planters. And in a Board of Agriculture report for 1811, was commended posthumously for his remarkably thriving plantations. And of course, posthumously is important because the purchase of a landed estate like this has an immediate dynastic um, implication. So it's, even though he you know, doesn't love to see that commendation, his, his son, although in effect his grandson by this point, um, kind of carries, is able to carry that um, to carry that um, forward. So patriotism um, was a kind of large tenet of the tree planting anyway, for these men who were kind of um, engaged in agricultural, um, in, in agricultural developments. And tree planting was closely aligned to patriotism in this era anyway, owing to the British Navy's continued need for timber. Um, and the report casts Tharp explicitly as a noteworthy improving landlord, and then for incorporates him within a wider dialogue of estate improvement, of utility, and of patriotism, which allows little room for accusations of West Indian excess, profligacy, or otherness which was vital because Tharp moved to England, as I said, in the early 1790s, which is a period in which abolitionists are mounting sustained attacks against transatlantic slavery and its agents. Uh, Sarah Yeh and Krista Petley both have written brilliantly and done substantial work on the perceptions of West Indian planters in these decades and shown that um, as metropolitan attitudes towards slaveholding hardened, they were characterised variously as uh, laughably ill-mannered, lacking in taste, socially pretentious, grossly luxurious, sexually depraved, and prone to violence. Um, and this is one image I'm gonna share here among many of cigar smoking in Jamaica, um, which attacks colonists by maligning their social propriety uh, and pointing to their perceived vulgar vulgarity and excess. And planters like Tharp worked hard to counter these perceptions and accusations. And in his case, the fashion for agricultural improvement offered a coterie of gentlemen a veneer of patriotism and a way to make his estate profitable. None of which is to say that Tharp's actions arose from any real patriotic fervor. As people have demonstrated, landowners were often revealed as particularly disingenuous when they in fact were disinclined to sell much needed timber to the Navy, even while accepting commendations for patriotic planting. So I don't know whether that, that kind of Tharp fits that model, but everything that I know about him suggests that he might well have been so. Um, then the late 1790s, while Tharp was in situ, he spent um, an outstanding further £60,000 on shipping and bringing his total expenditure to £100,000 um, over the decade in an absolute flurry of spending, which included a naturalistic landscape, uh, which um, was put in by a capability brown disciple, William Eames, the purchase of two full Wedgwood dinner services, race horses, a quote, prodigious quantity of special carp for his new lake, um, and in a rather grotesque purchase, and I did wanna share this, uh, you can see it, a bird of paradise. Now, this particular, I think, speaks to the way that flora and fauna from distant spaces are repurposed in the metropole as desirable fripperies, but it also neatly sums up Tharp's clumsiness in matters of taste, since against the record, he writes, quite gauchely, this is a fashionable present for Mrs. Tharp. So he's kind of clearly clocked that this is something that people ought to have, but not necessarily understanding um, really having any kind of sense of fashion himself. So it's against this backdrop of, of 
the kind of over the top spending in 1802, that Tharp returns to Jamaica actually to administer his affairs, which is why we have this profusion of letters, some of which I already quoted from, um, between him and his son, John. And although Tharp never returned to England because of war with France um, and his declining health, he intended to, and he only leaves John and John's family at Chippenham as kind of de facto caretakers. And during this period, what we see is John Tharp managing the estate with an absolutely remarkable degree of specificity. He's dispatching a regular flow of instructions from Jamaica down to the number of, he wants to know how many herons, are on the site, how many fish he's got left in his lake, game ought to be preserved, rabbits and hares ought to be controlled. And his enthusiasm for all these things, I think, confirms that a distance of nearly 5,000 miles is not prohibiting his participation in estate management. Um, and his instructions to John give us an insight into the transatlantic operations of such a, such a family and into the expectations that Tharp had for his son as his proxy in England. Um, Kate Donington, Sarah Pearsall, Simon Smith, many people have done um, work on kinship networks and explored the crucial role um, of, of kin within transatlantic families. And just as often happened in Tharp's case, his family members were strategically placed in different parts of the empire, and he relied on them to manage various aspects of his business, to provide regular news, and to take care of aspects of provisioning for the various outposts of his um, business. Even his estranged wife remained part of the network and she continued um, to write to him to and she traded uh, metropolitan gossip for Caribbean goods, writing here in a spectacular non secretar the king is mad, quite mad, the Duke of Cambridge is the only person who can manage him, I've never received the sugar and coffee you sent me. So this is kind of constant, any, any news that comes is often come with wanting um, an update on provisions, an update on kind of commodities as well. So things, things and goods are at the forefront of all of these exchanges, even in the most intimate family missives. And Tharp, um, is really dissatisfied with his son John, who does not prove to be the most diligent caretaker, nor a particularly ardent pupil of his father's wisdom. Um, he strained continuously against an allowance of £1,500 a year and provoked his father with needless spending. Um, he spent um, an absolutely vast amount of money on alcohol. He ordered 55 gallons of brandy in four months between December 1803 and April 1804, in addition to numerous orders of champagne, Madeira, Hock, Burgundy and Claret. There was already a healthy stat seller established at Chippenham and his father sent what gifts, wine gifts periodically. Um, and then the final straw was when he bought a huge amount of wine from the French ambassador's cellar auction in 1803, causing Tharp to pretty much threaten to put everything down and come be, make the journey back from Jamaica in order to take him in hand. And as this, spend, this trend of overspending increases, Tharp begins increasingly in his letters to bemoan Chippenham's unprofitability and the general state of the family finances, which in fact are actually reasonably robust, but he wants to try and castigate his son. And I'm, the, the relationships between these first generation Arab East West Indians and their children is particularly interesting. And um, we all I'm sure know about the case of William Thomas Beckford's prodigious overspending, particularly when he built the enormous folly of Font Hill Abbey, which then pretty much just fell down. That, that, that is a monumental example, but it's not isolated. And the children of these planters were accused of the worst kinds of profligacy, more so even usually than the original planters themselves. And it's been alleged that when turned loose on the streets of metropolitan cities, that they reveled in excessive drinking, dueling, gambling, blood sports, and all other frivolities. And as Sarah Yeh has rightly noted, these pastimes were common enough amongst the general young population of Britain, but they became the defining features of a Caribbean lifestyle. And Tharp felt that John's lack of propriety would leave the family, as a transatlantic family, open to criticism. He wrote saying, I'm sorry to hear you remark that living so near Newmarket leads to expense. This was what I dreaded. You are in the worst of all possible situations. You are dangerous and you are not respectable. And so uh, particularly ironic given that Tharp was heavily invested in racehorses, it's a little bit, you know, um, do as I say and not as I do, but you can really sense through the letters the kind of sense of anxiety and the inability to control. He's trying to control across this kind of transatlantic divide, but he's actually losing control. And what's perhaps most interesting about Tharp's self-presentation in his letters as both um, is that he presents himself as a kind of honest farmer, that, that patriotic friend of, of Thomas Coke of Norfolk that we heard about earlier and the poor West Indian um, and it's helpful because 
that poor West Indian veneer is belied by his relationship with material things. So I've already indicated his enormous spending, £100,000 in 10 years on the estate, um, and this continued as he set about to return to Jamaica. There was another flurry of spending. He took an array of goods with him, an extraordinary um, moment of kind of, of, of the, the moment of movement was was really remarkable in terms of the goods that, that went with him. He commissioned an organ from London to be shipped to his parish church. He dispatched fashionable and state-of-the-art objects. Um, one good example is that in the months before leaving, he ordered a replica of um, what he called a friend's German wagon, but not having seen the vehicle. It's a bit like, you know, you want to imagine it's about hearing an, about an Audi or something and just wanting it because it's the most expensive thing. But it turned out to be a barouche box uh, something a little bit like this, which um, when he finally took possession, he concluded rightly that it was completely unsuitable for Jamaica's tropical climate, writing, quote, I do not think it will survive our tremendous rain. Nonetheless, he shipped it, um, and it appears that his wish to return to Jamaica with fashionable and novel objects from the Metropole exceeded practical considerations, such as the need for a watertight contrivance, as we see here. And of course, as we know, self-fashioning mattered much, as much as it, in Jamaica um, as it did in Britain. He, and so, so uh, thanks to a generation of Atlantic historians, we now know that returning slaveholders relied on their West Indian estates to fund their lives in Britain. Um, but it's interesting to see that the kind of um, economic transatlantic operation is well understood, but that the transmission of luxury and cultural goods is still little recorded and tends to be dominated by binary assumptions about these spaces, i.e. that things are moving um, in the other direction. And actually, it's a good way to challenge ideas, um, prevailing attitudes towards West Indians in this period, because in Tharp's case, the movement of small items, I'm going to list here of um, just the household goods that he took with him, um, show that, of course, everything that he needed in Chippenham, he also needed in Jamaica. And that's interesting because, as Krista Petley has shown, slaveholders' eating habits uh, became a site over which they were attacked by abolitionists as grotesque and not quite British, they were thought not to use cutlery, for example, and their legendary feasts, which had been characterized in the mid 18th century as hospitable, became interpreted as gluttonous by its close. So contrary to all these perceptions, the goods chip shipped from Chippenham to Jamaica show an overlap of domestic utensils and eating habits. Of course, we would know that that would be the case, um, but it does just jar with the sort of um, attitudes that are being uh, promulgated about West Indians in the metropolitan press at this time. So I'll wrap up um, shortly, but I just also wanted to say he, he also transmitted his equestrian interests across the Atlantic, which is really quite extraordinary. Um, shipping his prized bay colt, which was aptly, if really unimaginatively, also named Chippenham there to stud at the end of its new market career in 1804. Uh, Chippenham was only four generations removed from the prestigious Godolphin Arabian, and Tharp had commissioned a painting of his valuable horse from sporting painter Benjamin Marshall, um, probably not dissimilar to this one. So the horse um, actually is, goes off to Jamaica, but he keeps the painting in Chippenham Park, that is. Um, and in a clear example of Tharp picturing both Chippenham's horse and estate, he writes to his son John more than once to ensure that the painting is hanging in his dining room, quote, over the mantle. And I think it's really striking to consider the image of the aging West Indian proprietor writing from Jamaica to check the minutiae of the furnishings of his dining room in rural Cambridgeshire. And I think that really clearly shows that he is able to conceive of the spatiality of a whole empire within an empire, such as it was, um, and felt able to control many aspects of it, or at least is attempting to control aspects of it. So, um, Writing to John at the end of 1802, Tharp described the ideal investment strategy as, quote, land is for parade and poverty, funds are for wealth and comfort. He understood the performative and dynastic value of Chippenham, and he worked hard to appropriate the benefits of the agricultural revolution, and he succeeded in a certain amount of reputational laundering from West Indian, Arab East, to improving gentlemen. And it's through his relationship to material goods that Tharp's complaints about his status and his wealth are revealed as at least partially disingenuous and that he was sufficiently confident in a continuance of colonial affairs to expand a luxurious life in both Jamaica and his English country house. Thanks. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Would you mind unscreen sharing and yeah. then we can, um, we can talk. Um, I'm fascinated by that micromanagement at a distance of 5,000 miles. Um, he seems, um, actually, I was going to ask a question, but we've got them coming 
typing in the chat and I can ask you my questions anytime. So I'm going to go, <laughs> I'm going to go to the chat um, and uh, let our participants, um, our seminar participants, ask their questions. Oh, so um, Jalaluddin Khan um, asks, how was fine art transfer between the West Indies and the UK? Um, and what does, uh, what do the image subjects tell us about power and ownership? That's a, that's a great question. I mean, I think as as I sort of intimated there, we are we are well aware that there is a huge amount of art being transmitted back from the UK. Um, I shouldn't say back from the UK to um, Jamaica. It's just that um, those kind of movements of goods still, as I sort of suggested, get trapped in the idea of um, the binary between metropole and colony. And in fact, we need to see it in people's inventories to see that to sort of see the reality of that and like fine art or, or a fine um, uh, organ as in the case of the parish organ you know that, that actually there's a, there's a continual draw of these goods because there's a hugely developed um, elegant society in Jamaica and the other West Indian um, Caribbean islands that kind of have a call for this um, and there's been a huge amount of really brilliant work done on inventories as well and sort of showing that house household inventories in Jamaica have you know kind of stellar works of art. Um, what I'm particularly interested in for my research is the way in which goods are moving cyclically in the in the Atlantic world. So quite often things are coming back and forth. If a person, <clears throat> excuse me, wants to have something with them for a few years in the UK, they'll bring it back with them, whether that, you know, portraits, particularly portraits of loved ones, but then they will go, they'll take them back again to Jamaica or, or whichever Caribbean island it is once they go, once they return. And I think that kind of um, back and forth movement is something that we haven't really explored at all. And it really does kind of show up um, just how much fluidity there is in terms of objects between country houses, as it were, in this period. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Lucy Moynihan um, asked, well, first she says, thank you for such an interesting paper. Um, I just wondered whether Tharp was transporting books between, um, I know a subject dear to your heart, um, uh, between his Jamaican and English estates, or whether he had a library in his English country house. Um, have you come across him interacting with any literary societies, subscription libraries, um, either in Jamaica or England? And I should just add that Elizabeth is also a rare books expert, so you have asked the right question, Lucy. Thank you. It's a great question. I, I'm I'm borderline laughing just because I feel I know Tharp um, so well that I, I mean I know he could read. I mean clearly he could read because he could write. But I I, could, I mean there's not really I can think of a man who seemed less kind of uh, invested in the sort of intellectual capital of reading. And but having said that, I, I haven't had any reference. I haven't seen any reference to a library. But I wouldn't be at all surprised if he had one because he was very concerned with those things that were markers of the gentleman's country house. And therefore, I think it's almost impossible that he wouldn't have had um, a library. He, I'm trying to think if he ever mentions it. He doesn't. And that's curious, too, because, as I say, he likes to micromanage the rooms in his house. Um, he, you know, he wants to know where the furniture is and he wants to know where the paintings are. But that never extends to books. And he certainly, as far as I can see, hasn't gone near a kind of a, a lending library. I mean, there's not, nothing that I can think of in the papers, but that's interesting and I'll, I will consider it, partly because actually the libraries of West Indian Aravistes as kind of repositories and, and refracting spaces of colonial knowledge is something I'm really interested in, so thank you for that, I will think about it. Mm. And, and, and in fact, the absence of a library um, kind of speaks volumes, if you'll forgive the pun, pun as well as uh, you know, if he had one as well. Um, ben uh, Cowell says, great paper, thank you. The house remains in the same family today, I think. Have you spoken to them at all about the research? Um, I'd be interested to hear their thoughts and observations. It does, yes. And I have tried to speak to them. Uh, perhaps it's worth another go. I um, know they've worked with some historians before because there is um, out there a kind of paper about the history of the house. Um, which I think is available online, which has obviously been done um, with the kind of uh, blessing, as it were, of the family. They've they've been into the house and taken pictures. I would be I would I'd be very interested to know whether they're keen to hear more. I mean, they do they do engage with it. I think to an extent on their website, but as we've discussed in the past, as a thriving wedding reception venue, um, there are challenges to tackling this kind of history. Although I would always say, of course, you know, commission the research, you know, get a report made. Um, yeah, who know, who knows where the where what kind of collaborations with universities and other um, bodies might come out of that? So I'd be very interested to talk to them and um, mm. reach out again. Brilliant. Um, 
I am conscious that we have gone a bit over time, but I wanted to allow some time for questions. Um, but as we've now reached the end of the questions in the chat, I am going to wrap up there. So I would just like to say thank you, a huge thank you again to our three speakers, to Lauren, to Shaheen and to Elizabeth. And thank you every, everybody for coming and for your questions as well. Um, and those questions that we didn't have time to give to Shaheen, um, we will follow up by um, email so, or do, do get in touch. Um, so just a quick reminder that booking is open for our next seminar on the 17th of March, and we hope to see you all there. Thank you very much. Goodbye.